Everyone, this is Saeed Gordon with DOF Creations. Uh, we appreciate uh, everyone, um, I guess, watching over Zoom. Um, our presentation today is regarding collaboration in K-12 for rapid response and reduced exposure. Um, I have Viv Gordon and Carly Stepp with me here as well from the DOF team. Um, this discussion is going to be following up on some of the things we discussed last week. Uh, most of our conversation last week was about how cyber attacks have changed and the evolution of cyber attacks uh, as a tool or weapon uh, on the part of cyber criminals. Uh, we talked a little bit about how they partner together and work together uh, both internally and bringing in outside resources as a way to increase their odds of being able to uh, break down your proverbial doors and uh, succeed in a cyber attack. Our conversation today is about what you can do, both partnering internally, as well as finding outside resources, whether other districts or uh, supporting organizations uh, to help you to better protect yourself. So with that, we'll get started. So partnership and collaboration, first steps, what does that look like? Step one, collaboration is always going to start with your team and your colleagues. Uh, one of the big things that you're going to want to learn over time is also what are the total number of events that your staff has seen um, in their time? Uh, you may have some folks on your staff who have never uh, been forced to deal with a cyber attack of any kind, which is great. Uh, that's obviously where everybody would want to be at. Uh, but considering that Cybersecurity is the focus that everybody should have. Uh, hopefully somebody on your team has survived one, been through one, and can also be a resource that everybody else in the district can look from, look to, um, or maybe there are multiple people there. Um, and the third area to look is often with local law enforcement or a vendor partner. Uh, between your local law enforcement and some of the cyber response resources they may have available, or the current vendor partner you're working with, what are the cyber uh, security training resources they have? How have they responded to cybersecurity attacks and breaches in the past? What do they suggest? And can they help you to um, build uh, your go-to strategy as far as uh, recovery and response? How IT and K-12 has changed. We talked about this uh, a little bit last week, and we talked about the increasing level of severity and number of attacks in K-12. And again, talking about that today. Um, one of the other challenges that we see, and this comes in the part of collaboration and how people work together, we see from many IT directors, and Viv, I'm gonna ask you to, to tell a story here. I think you may know which one I'm asking you for before I ask. Um, but we've seen that many IT directors and folks in technology have concerns about requesting funding. Um, there are a lot of times where certain needs on the technology side maybe don't get met because IT leaders are unsure of whether or not they'll be able to get funding. Uh, if they make a request, what's going to happen? Is that going to be seen as them maybe being, um, you know, maybe asking for too much? Um, and it's one of those situations they have not because they ask not. Um, but this is one of the early stages of collaboration within a district. Do you know what the needs are of the IT staff? Do you know what your IT, IT department needs uh, to keep you safe? And one of those questions is, did they have the budget and the financial resource? Can you speak to, um, I think you might have also spoken to it last week, but the process of helping some of your districts, one in North Florida, and I think there was uh, actually two in North Florida. Um, how was that process for you in helping them, coaching them up on requesting that funding, helping them to understand how ESSER requirements had changed so that they understood that it was a permissible request on their part? Well, typically, um, most IT departments are not up to speed on the requirements of, for grants and fiscal responsibilities in general. So the first step we did was help them put together a proposal that they could submit to their management. And in the instance of the school or one of the schools in North Florida, they got just about everything except for um, DDoS that they requested. So that particular request encompassed everything from firewalls to cameras, to switching and one of the major parts of that um, award was soft phones. We had teachers during COVID using their own personal phones and the district decided that 
in another instance like this, we could never have the teachers using their own resources the way they did. And that was one of the projects that was covered. Um, there's another district and without naming names, I know this one, you worked on them for maybe um, the IT department was willing to request the funding and they got their funding almost immediately. I think it was, um, uh, let me see how I can describe it. Yeah, district. it was another North Florida school. Yes. Um, they had a wireless project. Part of it was going to uh, be utilized um, part of it was going to utilize E-rate funding, and they had a major shortfall. They would not have been able to do the entire project had they not utilized the ESSA funds. For about a year, the IT department thought that they couldn't utilize those funds for projects um, like this one, like the wireless, and they asked for the funding at 2.30. By 5 o'clock, it was that day, it was approved. So this is where the collaboration with DOF can be very helpful because we can show the IT departments as well as the superintendents how to navigate um, these uncharted territories as far as the different buckets of funding goes. And yes, it is cumbersome. It is a bit daunting, but we've been doing this for years and we tell our customers to lean on us. Definitely. Um, and again, going back to, you know, what we have here at the bottom of this slide, um, they have not because they asked not. Uh, with ESSER dollars, E-rate, and grant programs, there are a wide variety of funding resources available uh, in the K-12 space to assist with physical security. Of course, uh, school districts have many challenges and concerns as it relates to physical security and uh, safety on campus as well. Um, so there are boatloads of resources in that space. Um, but again, communicating, speaking under, speaking with everybody uh, within your district and understanding what everyone's needs are, that's going to be step one in figuring out you know, what it is that we need to go after. If nobody knows what the other person's needing, how they can help one another, it doesn't really matter if you have you know, a massive bucket of money sitting around, it's not going to get used in the ways that will be most helpful. And speaking of funding, um, again, there are a wide variety of resources available, both for cybersecurity as well as physical security in K-12. Uh, you have Title IV, which is a student support and academic enrichment program. This can be used to address technology, but there are limits on how this can be used to support uh, IT and cybersecurity. Uh, this one is geared uh, largely towards physical resources um, and uh, academic focused or academic um, initiatives with an academic focus rather than technology focus. But there are carve outs here through this one that do directly support technology and cybersecurity. We also have the Stop School Violence Program, which again has um, very narrow and specific uses for where technology will fit in. Um, but the heavy focus on this is around emergency preparedness. So as we discussed today, uh, as it relates to, co to collaboration, we talked about this last week as well, but you have responsibilities and requirements as it relates to notice uh, to parents, to other stakeholders, um, communicating with um, external resources Utilizing emergency preparedness or understanding emergency preparedness is not just a physical safety issue, but it's also a cybersecurity issue. So as you're improving emergency preparedness in your district for physical safety, um, this is something where you can kind of kill two birds with one stone in a, in, a, in a sense. And same thing here, I would say, for the school violence and prevention program. I will say a difference between the school violence prevention program and the stop school violence program. Stop school violence does also allow um, um, private or non-public entities, non-public educational institutions to apply and go after that funding. Um, and we'll make these resources, these links here available to you after this presentation. So going back to how IT has changed, you know, a few years ago, you could hear one of my colleagues talk about, you know, and this is actually Viv. So Viv, I say I made you nameless here, but um, this is that that extrix helping them to understand how ESSER dollars could be utilized, helping them to understand, um, you know, what the cost is of cyber neglect, but also how many resources, both financial and in regard to people and opportunities, 
how many resources are available to stop cyber neglect or prevent cyber neglect, making sure that you are prepared for the cyber challenges, the technology demands that you face, um, and all of the people and things that are coming your way and trying to attack your district. So we have, I wanted to use this as sort of a, a unique example of collaboration in the K-12 space. This may not be an example of what everybody in the K-12 landscape will do, the power and the value of partnering together and working with one another um, in order to protect yourself. Um, so that example is a partnership between two school districts in California. One is the Orange County Department of Education, and the other is the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. Um, they did this partnership to enhance their cybersecurity defenses um, and to kind of share resources across districts in order to maximize what they had uh, to build a stronger stronger line of defense. So they increased, um, they utilized this to build a joint cybersecurity program to increase uh, their employee training, pull together resources for greater vulnerability assessments, and also to assist with incident response planning. Um, they also built their own SOC or Security Operations Center to help with network monitoring and, and identify potential threats. This group ended up detecting some more attack that was targeting another school district. Um, this school district served 16,000 students and was a part of that partnership between these two larger school districts. Uh, they were able to contain the attack or quarantine the attack and ensure that no data was lost, which means that there was no, um, there was only a significant impact on day-to-day -day operations. Uh, for anybody that watched our last discussion, you remember that uh, operations can get taken down anywhere from three days to possibly three weeks or more in the K-12 space when there is a cyber attack, a successful cyber attack. And again, this highlights how sharing resources and expertise can enhance and strengthen your cybersecurity defenses, better protect your systems, your data, and your users. And, you know, as the end result or the goal that's most important for all of us, protecting ourselves, or in this case, yourself as the district. And as I mentioned previously, this is not necessarily the example that everybody would follow, you know, multiple districts collaborating and partnering to protect themselves. Um, but this is just to highlight the value and the impact of collaboration. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later today. But for many states, there are education organizations that focus on technology, whether they are CIO led, superintendent led, or open to any and all leaders within any and all districts across the state, there are always groups and communities available where you can partner, learn from one another, um, take guidance from the experience, experiences that others have had, and use that to make yourself smarter and more prepared for the next series of challenges that may come your way. So when we're looking at what that incident response team needs to be, you're talking about collaboration. Your incident response team is kind of the best example of collaboration um, to protect yourselves. You wanna make sure you're empowering your IT team to write and implement policy. Um, one of the groups that we're a part of um, as one of the technology education groups we're a part of, uh, one school district was actually breached, I wanna say a couple of weeks back and they were sharing some of their insights and some of the ins and outs of the breach, how they've responded to it and recovered from it. Um, and some of the things that the IT director talked about was that there were policy changes he wanted to address cyber hygiene in the district. And he was, you know, for lack of a better term, a bit uncomfortable about making those changes. Um, he was uncomfortable about how the district would view that, if he would get the necessary buy-in, and ultimately some of those changes that he chose not to make and chose not to push for ended up being things that could have possibly kept the district safe. So when we're talking about, you know, as Viv had talked about earlier with uh, a lot of technology leaders don't know uh, where the funding is, uh, and other times they are concerned or maybe even a little afraid to ask for funding, um, your technology leaders will sometimes Sometimes technology leaders know quite a bit, but they're not able to get everybody on board with some of their goals or initiatives. They're not able to um, sell some of their needs or ideas. Um, and that kind of creates a challenge. You have your non-technical leaders like yourself who are seeing and hearing and understanding what's going on around you, but may not necessarily know all the ins and outs of technology. 
those folks who are on the technical side that know all the ins and outs, but may not necessarily be able to sell or explain to you exactly how these technology um, challenges or goals are going to impact the district overall, it creates this small gap. And that small gap can be the difference between staying, stay, staying safe, staying online, and possibly uh, or po possibly succumbing to a cyber attack. So when we talk about empowerment for your IT team, giving your IT team a space not just to make requests of you, but also to educate you, to inform you, and to help you to become um, an advocate for them internally. Um, it takes collaboration and it takes partnership to create change. And some of the changes that are required in the K-12 space as it relates to cybersecurity will require partnership across district leadership to make sure that everybody from parents, staff, students, um, other members of leadership are all bought in because cybersecurity for any organization is always going to be a team effort. Communication. As we highlighted in slide one, when we're talking about what is the level of experience and expertise for your staff as it relates to responding to a cyber attack, this is a big element of communication. What's your process? How are you keeping parents, staff, and law enforcement up to date? How are you managing your notifications? Who's going to be the person that's taking the lead in that effort? How are you documenting your response and your recovery efforts? Uh, as you're communicating internally, who's the first call that you're making? Is that person who is maybe most experienced the person that's getting the first call? Director, is it always going to be the superintendent? Um, who gets the first call? And then from there, who's the next call? Is it going to be local law enforcement? From in many occasions, people notify the FBI that they've been breached. Um, they request resources from the uh, state um, state national guard. Um, who is your first call and then who is your second call? Um, and as we talked about communication as it related to the funding slide, um, emergency preparedness often involves communication, being able to communicate internally, but also being able to communicate out. Those are often VoIP solutions, phone systems, communications resources that can all be a part of your funding process, just like it needs to be a part of your planning process. And incident identification. How are you going to identify your threats? Do you have any types of plans in place for how you can, again, as we talked about empowering your IT team, do you need to empower somebody to be that first line of defense uh, in identifying the threats and understanding what's going on? How are you training yourself, your partners, um, your staff to stay on top of new events and new threats, um, to prepare yourself and protect yourself against these new threats? How can you work together with your district or maybe learn from others in order to try to keep yourself safe to prevent the attack or if something does occur to be aware of what's going on so you can respond quickly. So finding the right partners and resources. This again kind of comes back to collaboration, but there are a lot of places where you can just search for and find the information you're looking for. This may be where you want to have your IT directors taking the lead or a dedicated person, maybe if it's a non-technical person who's leading your incident response team, they don't necessarily have to be a technology expert, but they do need to be informed and aware. So when we're looking at university organizations, you can look at the different K-12 um, institutions or uh, organizations that help to protect uh, educational institutions. You can have those resources providing training, guidance, and resources. They might provide templates for you for your incident response plan or technology strategy long term. Um, you can collaborate with your vendors. Of course, you have folks like us. And again, with Viv um, being so well versed in the K-12 space, she has done a lot to assist her school districts and just staying aware of what's going on um, and keeping them safe and abreast of some of the challenges out there. Uh, some of the events you've hosted, um, and is it okay if we name some of the um, some of the the K twelve uh, leadership organizations you've worked with? Uh, I want to say you know Pace here, but is that okay to say their name? Sure, you can say Pace. I've worked with Heartland. Um, you've worked with Nefic. Can you speak to some of the programs you've put on for those organizations that center on cybersecurity preparedness and training? We haven't done many around um, cybersecurity. We're in the process of doing an event um, on May 19th for um, PACE that will entail, um, which is going to be exclusively covering um, cyber preparedness 
um, cyber cybersecurity solutions and products. Um, in this instance, we're going to be focusing on some of the free resources. So we're sort of going to shoot ourselves in the foot a little bit, but there's so many um, advantageous programs out there that we think the districts can avail themselves of, and that May 19th event will um, target or will be centered around those uh, programs. And we'll be bringing in our cybersecurity um, guru, uh, Todd Matusak. He will be doing that presentation. Fantastic. Um, I know for something I've seen, and this has been more from local government, they'll ask us, um, you know, to help them with certain resources like, um, you know, stopping inappropriate, uh, uh, stop searching and, um, you know, uh, browsing inappropriate content um, in the cybersecurity space for K-12. Have you gotten any requests recently for uh, resources or information from any of your districts that anybody have maybe a strange request that, you know, you kind of had to dig in a little bit and, and do some research on your own? No, no strange requests, but a lot of the districts, because there's so much funding available, are starting to do their projects on their wish list. Like we recently funded, um, or uh, yeah, funded the um, SIM product for one of our districts. We're doing a rubric project for another district. We're presenting. Um, rubric and sim to a large district in North Florida. Um, so yes, a lot of the districts now are realizing that there's no time like the present. They probably will never see these, this kind of funding again. And what I've convinced them to do, because a lot of districts were worried about, well, how do you support it years two, three, four and on? Just do a five year, um, bundle in whatever product you're looking at and that will take you through you know the next five years and cross the bridge in five years of what you do for funding by that time you'll have another um, revision uh, or version of the uh, those solutions and you might even have to upgrade to something totally new because these bad actors they're constantly reinventing themselves and the districts are going to have to stay abreast of those threats. Gotcha. Um, and again, as a refresh, SIM refers to your security monitoring and alerting tool. It's kind of a, um, a singular solution that aggregates all of that information. Um, it helps you to kind of learn and see what's going on as far as uh, potential security concerns, but it's also a really important tool. If you do get breached, it's a big tool that helps with research um, and being able to figure out what happened to you so you can recover faster. And that rubric resource is a disaster recovery tool that helps you to back up your data, be able to know what it is that you have right now. And if something is does ever occur to you, it helps you to encrypt that data and recover from that point. So that way you can hopefully get back on your feet faster. Um, we will have another section on this in a moment. Information sharing is also really big. This is a place where you can go and learn and share um, and gain new insights. Uh, there's always research being done in this space. Um, it's not just the folks that are similar to you who are seeing these attacks or maybe have been victims of these attacks. You also have your state level entities, your federal entities that are constantly doing research and sharing and aggregating information and putting that out to you, giving you um, greater access to more information in one single place. So in this case, you know, MSI SAC, uh, this is a major resource for all public sector, all government entities. So as we highlighted MSI SAC, this is a, a really important resource as it comes to, as it relates to cybersecurity training. Um, for some local entities, we actually had a school district that we were working with that utilized, I believe, a testing team um, to go and do a, um, a, 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 not necessarily a pen test, uh, but another type of vulnerability assessment for their district. I believe they needed that for a cyber uh, cybersecurity insurance policy. Um, so those, again, free resource available, not just information, but hands-on support, um, a powerful tool they're using in the government space. You have your K-12 Security Research Center. Um, this is another valuable tool, obviously K-12 specific, but this is sort of um, you know, a relatively unaffiliated group. Obviously, they they do across the country, particularly in the uh, federal space, uh, but they're relatively unaffiliated. They do a lot of their own independent research. 
You have CISA, which is is of course by the K-12 Cybersecurity Act. Um, CISA does a lot of targeted research and programs on uh, K-12 cybersecurity, but they also do K-12. We've been waiting for a little bit of time to hear um, what new mandates are going to come. Um, we've had whispers of, um, I would say, whispers of different requirements or regulations coming to K-12. For the most part, CISA has just been doing um, guidance and research on their part. Uh, but we do expect to hear more more requirements and regulations coming from CISA in the near future. National Cybersecurity Center for Excellence, again, another great resource that helps to um, keep people aware of what's going on both in public sector and private security developments and events. And the FBI InfraGuard. Uh, if you remember me mentioning earlier, the FBI is often a a top resource that people will reach out to if they are the victim of a cyber event. FBI makes resources available to all individuals, public sector and private, as it relates to cybersecurity, intelligence, resources, preparedness, um, and just keeping you abreast of what's going on in the cybersecurity space. So as we mentioned about CISA, while they are supposed to be an entity that does rulemaking for cybersecurity in K-12, as of right now, they've mostly provided guidance and done research. One of the things that they discussed is ways to help school districts to protect themselves against cyber attacks. So they provided a list of, of resources and strategies, things that you need to be doing as that you can't be. Some of that includes your cybersecurity assessments. Um, they offer cybersecurity assessments to K-12 that can help to identify vulnerabilities and provide recommendations. They also will provide you with a cybersecurity framework. Uh, this is uh, mostly in, aligned with NIST, but um, they have a couple of tweaks here and there that are specific to K-12. Uh, but again, this takes some of the guesswork out of needing to develop your own plan. You can take some of the templates that are already available and use those to build the foundation for your own plans and guidance. They have guidance regarding what to do for cyber hygiene, how to uh, reduce your exposure by reducing some of the information and access that you give to people and have out uh, readily available. Of course, information sharing, they're a great resource to be able to gain new insights or information that you see available. So if you're if you're the individual that's trying to help other districts, other similarly situated um, um, entities and leaders like yourself, another great resource for information sharing. And cybersecurity training, um, there are a wide variety of courses and resources uh, on CISA um, regarding, you know, information and intelligence. Um, I would say I have not personally used CISA's training resources, but they have been being more used, uh, especially as the K-12 Cybersecurity Act came out and their presence has grown as a federal entity for cyber awareness and cyber preparedness for school districts across the country. So as we mentioned with the K-12 Cyber Resource Guide and some of the work that CISA has been doing, um, one of the big things they've done is publishing a variety of alerts, advisories, and bulletins around what's going on in K-12. It is incredibly challenging to try to, by yourself, stay completely aware and informed of what's going on in the cyber landscape. There is a great deal of change and a great deal of nuance from event to event and organization to organization. Um, it is never a bad thing to lean on a large entity, a vetted resource, um, as you're trying to learn about what's going on and stay aware and on top of everything. So as we talked about your first steps at the beginning of our discussion, now we're looking at, our, at your next steps as we get to the end of this discussion. You need to identify who has and manages what resources or responsibilities. That may not necessarily be a technical issue of communications. Who is gonna be in charge of communications? Who is going to be in charge of communications to outside resources, whether that's law enforcement or to parents, and who manages communications internally? If you're talking about communications between leadership and the IT staff, uh, between uh, staff and other and other uh, higher level stakeholders within the district, how do you manage these different responsibilities? How do you, of course, manage your assets? What assets and resources, techn technology resources, do you have available, and who's in charge of those? Again, asking questions. Who do you call first? Who do you call next? And who is your in-house expert? And 
those things are going to be solely determined by you as a district. Of course, there are suggestions you can make. Having your IT leader in that position as the first call makes a lot of sense, but also looking at who has been. And if you have somebody on your staff that has been through two cyber events, maybe at a previous district, it would make sense to have that person at the very least in a leadership role within your incident response team um, and helping you to shape some of those policies and decisions. Always trying to learn from the people around you. Are there any cyber events that you can learn from, other leaders that you can speak to? Unfortunately, most, uh, most, leadership, most leaders in K-12, regardless of the state you're in, there's a district probably within an hour or two hours of you that has probably seen some type of cyber attack, whether it was a major breach or a minor breach. Um, there's probably somebody close to you that has seen something like this. Can you reach out to them? Can you speak to them? Can you learn from them? Um, we have organizations, as Viv mentioned, you have PACE, NEFECT, and Heartland in Florida. Um, you have your RISA TITA, which is a technology organization, technology it's uh, Tennessee Educational Technology Association in Tennessee. Um, they also have resources for instructional technology and not just for your CIOs and your IT directors. Uh, but your district, even if an organization is not geared to you as a superintendent or other, uh, other leader within uh, your school, you also have resources dedicated to technology professionals or instructional technology. There are a whole host of resources out there that your district can be a part of. And whether or not it's you that's uh, at the front, at sitting at the table, somebody within your district can be there soaking up that knowledge and that information. And then, you know, state and local associations, of course, those groups like we mentioned that are education focused, but also your MSI SACs, you have state level emergency preparedness organizations. Uh, almost every state has some form of a FEMA or emergency management department at the state level. Those are also really good resources. There are also certain grants that are coming from those departments. It would help to reach out to them to have a contact there so you can try to stay aware of the cybersecurity specific grant programs that those offices at the state level are managing right now. And every state has their own um, window for when those open. Florida had that program open late last year, then it closed and it reopened early this year. North Carolina just opened their program, so every state is going to be different. You're going to want to speak to that state contact for your local FEMA or emergency management department to stay aware of that stuff. And again, that that can directly support cybersecurity. So at DOF, as we always say, we measure success through service. Our goal is adding you with the right assistance, keeping you informed, keeping you aware of what's going on. And for anything that you feel um, you may not be able to do in house or on your own, let us know and we'd love to assist you. Um, Carly, Viv, is there anything that I might have missed on today or anything you wanted to touch on? No, I think you pretty much covered it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and do we have any follow-up questions today? No, I don't think so.